rest of you folks, I want you to go back to the book of Psalms. I want you to go to Psalm 20. Psalm 20. My message this morning is entitled, God Welcomes Bad Company. God Welcomes Bad Company. Psalm chapter 20. We're going to read verses uh, 1 and 2, drop down to verse 5, and then we'll drop down to verse 7, and then we'll drop down to verse 9. Well, you just follow along, okay? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 20, beginning with verse number 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion, or he will strengthen you out of Zion. Drop down to verse 5. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Drop down to verse number 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but he will remember the name of the Lord our God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse number 9. Save, Lord, let the king hear us when we call. I'm going to be kind of centering my verse, uh, my message today around verse number one. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Did you hear that? The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. God welcomes bad company. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the infallible word of God. Oh, my Father, as we probe this this morning, Lord, I pray that you would drive these truths deep into our heart. And Father, though it's a simple message, I pray it, would, pray it would be simply profound. You tell us that repetition is the price of learning. May we set this nail, drive it home, that we would never, ever forget it. Father, we praise you. We thank you as we stand in thy presence. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, beloved, as you see as we read this psalm some three times in this short little psalm, we saw in verses 1, 5, and 7 that David speaks about the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord. He says it again. The name of the Lord. And King David states here that the proper name for uh, the, this Lord here, or the name is the Hebrew word, it, it's Hashem. The ha Shem, the name. In fact, Orthodox Jews, they never call God God. They call him Hashem, the name. You'll read it in all their rabbinical writings. But this, name, this word, the name, or Hashem, speaks both of God's specific title, but it also speaks about his reputation, about his character. And King David states here that God's proper name is called the Lord. In other words, the Hebrew says Yahovah, or Yahuwah, or Yahweh. Now we transpose that in our English Bibles, we say Jehovah, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the literal Hebrew is Yahovah. Say that word, Yahovah. That's how it's literally said in the Hebrew. But anyways, beloved, this word Yahovah means the sovereign, supreme, eternal, self-existent, and almighty one. In other words, the only, one and only uncaused cause and creator God of the universe. And some four times in this psalm, the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, uppercase letters, is used to identify the very name and title of the supreme God whom here David and also we call our God. Would you say amen out there? Throughout the scriptures, beloved, God is always referred to as the Lord. Now, what does he mean when he uses this word Lord, this almighty, eternal, self-existent one, this sovereign and supreme being? Well, beloved, he's the only one, excuse me, the only one who is absolute deity. That's what he's trying to drive home. He's the only one who is absolutely omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He's the only one who's absolutely eternal and infinite, and the Bible says he's higher than the heavens. And by the way, we can't measure the heavens. Imagine that. And we, of course, we used to think there was just our galaxy. Now we found out there's literally millions of galaxies with the Hubble spacecraft, right? But in any case, beloved, well, moreover, this divine name, Lord, also refers to God's moral and spiritual character and reputation as being the only one who is absolutely holy. He's the only one who's absolutely perfect. He's immortal. He's the only one who is absolutely righteous and moral and sinless. This is what the psalmist is trying to drive home to you and I. Would you say amen out there? 
You see, beloved, so this divine name speaks of God as being the most exalted and perfect sovereign and supreme being in heaven and earth. In other words, he's infinitely higher than the seraphims. And every one of us, if we ever saw a seraphim, we'd fall on our face before God. He's infinitely higher than any angel. And he's infinitely higher than any fallen man. Yet, beloved, here we see this most high and lofty God as being the divine associate, the divine defender of the likes of a sinful man named Yahakov, Jacob. The Lord, he says here in verse number one, the name of the God of Yahakov, Jacob, defend thee. Now, beloved, Yahakov, what does that mean? Jacob. It means this. It means the heel holder or the heel catcher because he stole, excuse me, because he held on to his brother Esau's heel when he came forth out of the womb. This word Yahakov means the supplanter, the deceiver, the schemer, always scheming on men, scheming on God. Yahakov, the fraud, the liar, the cheat. That's what it means, beloved, because he stole his brother's uh, uh, birthright and his blessing. He's Yahakov. God is the supreme, exalted one, high and lifted up. And yet he brings in the same breath, in the same text, with Yahakov or Jacob. Now that's amazing to me, beloved. You hear me now. I could understand God being the divine associate and defender of Abel because he was a righteous man. The Bible says he offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. Amen? And you hear me now? I could understand God being the divine associate and defender of Seth because the Bible says Seth was a righteous man. Indeed, he was a godly man. And I could understand, beloved, God being the divine associate and the divine defender of Enoch. Uh, he was a righteous man. The Bible says Enoch walked with God 300 years, and he was not, for God took him. God raptured him. He snatched him off this earth. He said, you're coming up here with me. And I could understand God being the divine associate of uh, Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Indeed, the Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. What are you getting at, Pastor Joel? But Jacob, beloved, Jacob was a liar. Jacob was a deceiver, beloved, so why does God name drop a bad character like him as someone whom God will divinely associate with and defend? I'm saying God welcomes bad people like him. I don't understand it, i got to tell you, but you will by the time I get through this. I didn't understand it is probably what I should say. That's what I want to preach on to you this morning. God welcomes bad company. Now, beloved, there are some axioms that we all know and quote that will help me drive home this point to you this morning. For example, we say things like this, birds of a feather do what? They flock together. We all know that. All right, how about when you, if you lay down with dogs, you what? You wake up with fleas. Okay, you've done that before, huh? Okay. And beloved, we also say a man is known by what? The company he keeps. Isn't that a true accent? My dad used to say to me all the time, a man is known, Hawk, by the company he keeps. Well, beloved, you listen to me. The central truth that all these maxims are teaching is that we all generally associate with like kind, good, bad, or indifferent. You hear me now? Beloved, Scripture indeed declares that a man is known by the company he keeps. For example, an immoral and a filthy-minded man does not enjoy the company of a pure-minded man. Amen? It makes him uncomfortable. He'd rather chum with a bum. You see, folks, what I'm saying to you is simply this, that he's most comfortable hanging around people that are just like him. That's why we say birds of a feather do what? They flock together. If you're a thief, you like hanging around with thieves. You don't like honest people in your life unless they're handling your money. If you're a drunk, you like hanging around with people doing the same thing. Birds of a feather, indeed, flock together. Now, beloved, look at carnal people. They do not like to hang around with spiritual people. Why? Because when they do, they immediately come under conviction. Amen? Neither do backsliders like to chum with faithful Christians because they know this. It reminds them of how far they've fallen away and how much now they have to repent and fall on their face before God and once again right with them. 
And that's why, beloved, you'll see in a church, you'll, the church can be polarized. A lot of people who are not really, or the compromisers, they're not really, they don't want to get near those spiritual people. They call them what? Pharisees. They're legalists. No, because they love the Lord and they want to obey God. The other ones kind of want to straddle the fence. I want this and I want that and I want this and I want that going back and forth. So they don't like hanging around like that. And by the way, I don't like hanging around with carnal people either. I don't like talking about the things they talk about. I don't like doing the things that they're doing. You see, birds of a feather do indeed flock together. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, the Bible teaches this. In other words, what I'm saying, the Bible warns against keeping bad company lest you become morally and spiritually contaminated by them and then you become just like them. For example, we know the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, be ye not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Right? What fellowship has righteousness with right, uh, unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness? What's he saying? No missionary dating. You don't date an unsaved person. You don't marry an unsaved person. A Christian is not to get in business with an unsaved person because you've got two different beings that are overlords in your life, either God or the devil himself. Would you say amen? And beloved, the Bible warns us, for example, because he, he, he's telling us, you get next to these people that are unsaved, or they're going to drag you down. You get next to a carnal person, he'll drag you down. You get next to a backslider, he'll drag you down. And you get next to a person that doesn't have his, his doctrine screwed down tight. And beloved, he'll corrupt you. That's why the Bible says in Romans 16, 17, it commands us, it says, Mark them which cause divisions contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. For with good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. People who don't know any better. People don't really know the word of God. And it's so easy to be led astray. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 warns us to have no company. Now listen to what it says. With disobedient believers. In other words, the Bible says we're to shun them, even though we're still to treat them as a brother, hoping that we can recover them and they'll come back. Would you say amen out there? So what am I saying to you? We can see through the scriptures, beloved, that God tells us what he wants us to do is separate from people like this, lest they ruin our own walk with him. And they will. Now, I know everybody thinks, no, they won't. That's the deceitfulness of sin and the deception of your own heart. And you keep living like that, you will split hell, hell wide open. I, I'm just telling you because I love you. That's all. Uh, beloved, listen to me now. I, I wouldn't mess with you. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying this is what makes the name dropping of Jacob here and God being his divine associate and defender with the likes of such a sinner of him so abnormal, so unusual when you first read it. You see, beloved, here God does what he orders us not to do hanging around <laughs> with banned people. Now, name dropping, I want you to think about this, has literally become a pastime today. I read a ma ma uh, uh, magazine article uh, recently, beloved, and it said this, that name dropping is almost a sport in Hollywood, Hollywood today. It's almost a sport. He went on to say that many young and aspiring actors there who hope to be uh, strike it rich in show business, business and make it in show business take all kinds of odd jobs, and it said especially that as being a waiter or a bartender. Now why in the world do they want to be waiters and bartenders? For this reason. So they can meet some popular actor or prominent movie producer or important director at a bar or at a party, and they'll start conversing with them and perhaps they will give them a big break it says then the name dropper the, uh, then they that name drop uh, that popular celebrity's big name at every audition they do it so the people doing the hiring for a pocket say wait a minute you know that producer you know that actor over there you know that uh, director why good night then I'm going to give you a break so ultimately they'll give me a break for giving you a break and you know, beloved, what they were called in the article, listen to this. These name droppers were called by the unsaved social parasites, unquote. Imagine that. Dropping names like that. Social parasites. 
In other words, there were nobodies who were trying to fool folks into thinking that they were somebodies by dropping a name. However, sometimes, and we all have to admit this, name droppers do indeed get the big breaks through the connections and the juice of the names of the important people they really know. In other words, often a person will get a good job through name dropping. Oh, you know so-and-so? Well, he's my uncle. <laughs> Often, uh, beloved, a person will get a political office because they know someone and the person starts bringing them up through the ranks. Often a person will get rich and famous because they connect themselves to someone, they're like gum on their shoe, can't get them off, and they start getting the blessings that this person has in their life. I know what I'm talking about. Why, Pastor Joel? Because speaking of name dropping, when I first got out of the service, I did it. You see, beloved, when I first got out of the service, I bought myself a brand new dark green sports car, a GT6 Plus Triumph, five speed. And on the speedometer, the speedometer in that car went to 130 miles an hour, and I hate to admit this, but I buried that baby several times. Mama! And it was only this wide, and sometimes, I was crazy in them days, I'd go down the sidewalk so that people would be jumping off here and there, and I, you know, I never remember. But beloved, I love this sports car. So I'm driving down the Cape one day, and I wasn't speeding, to be honest with you, because I was in traffic. And the, the fastest light I ever saw in my, my life, it was green and then went yellow-red. And, I, and I'm downshifting, and there's no way I could stop, and I had to go through that red light, and my eye parked on the right-hand side, I saw a cruiser. I said, okay. So I went through the light. Immediately, I pulled over. I knew he was going to pull me over. He went, ooh. He just went around the corner, all right? Got behind me, walks out. License and registration. He takes it out. He looks at it. He says, Batello. Batello. And just as he said my name the second time, there's a huge lumber company down the Cape, a mammoth lumber company. It's called Batello Lumber Company. Only it's spelled B-O-T-E-L-L-O instead of H-O. In other words, it's Italian and not Portuguese. <laughs> it's Italian. So he's got my license. He says, Botello. And then all of a sudden, this guy in this big lumber company truck and bike beeps the horn. Hey, how's it going, officer? He says, oh, Botello. Is that Botello Lumber Company any relation to you? I said, he's my uncle. He says, get out of here. <laughs> I wasn't saved then. <laughs> Oh, beloved, I'm so glad that a name means something. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.1, a good name is better than precious ointment. You see, beloved, it's better than medicine that heals. Why? Because a good name represents the character and reputation of that person before all other people. They'll know you as a good person. They'll know you as being responsible. They'll know you as being trustworthy. They'll know you as being a man and woman of your word, a good name is better than precious ointment. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, a good name is often priceless. Why? Because it opens up doors of opportunity to you that heretofore were closed in your life. I want to give you another personal illustration. I remember applying for a bank loan to buy my first house. As I went into the bank, the banker looked at me, I looked at him, and he says, what's your name? I says, my name is Joel Francis Botelho. That's Joel Francis Botelho. He says, Patello, huh, started scratching his head. Now, my father's family was huge. I mean, there's 18 brothers and sisters, huge. And I'll never forget one time, we just dig a diversion on the illustration of an illustration. I was doing an investigation in Cambridge, and my car broke down. And I had no more tire. I had a flat tire, and my car broke down. I said, what am I going to do? So I looked in the phone book. I said, maybe there's somebody here named Patello. A whole page, Patello. <laughs> so I went, he goes here. And I hit that, and I looked. I says, okay, I called up, and I says, um, is this Manuel Botello? He says, see, Schnood. Yes, it is. I says, okay. My name is Joel Botello. Joel Botello, where are you from? I says, Plymouth. Who's your father? I says, JB. Oh, I'll be right there. Uh, well, we were related somehow. I didn't have a clue. But what I'm saying, so I go into the bank, and the banker says to me, what's your name? I says, Joel Francis Botello. He's Botello, Botello. He says, who's your father? He said, same thing. I says, my father is Joseph Patello. J.B.? I says, yes, J.B. They call him J.B. The fisherman? Yes, the fisherman. The one that used to work at Eads? How much you looking for? Oh, beloved, I want to tell you something right now. My folks always said to me, 
We don't have money, and we don't have riches to give you, but we've given you a good name, so keep it that way, and don't you embarrass us. And my father never ceased to add, or I'll kill you. You embarrass me, I'll kill you. The day you go to jail, you're staying in jail, is what he said to me, and he meant it. He wouldn't say, oh, oh Daddy, please, I don't want to stay here. He'd say, so, finca para qui? Finca para li, I should say. You're staying right there. <laughs> you did it, own it up. Own up to it. But you see, beloved, over the years, I've tried to take care of my name and protect it as both a Christian and also as a pastor. It stands for something. You listen to me now. When the devil tries to attack me to get me to quit, when the devil tries to attack me to tempt me to do something stupid or sinful in my life, when the devil tries to get me to discredit and dishonor the name of Christ or dishonor the name of, of my family, I always say, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, and I refuse to do it. And I hope you do. Oh, listen to me, Christian. You listen to me now. You've also got a name that really stands for something. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Would you say amen? you got a name. you got a name that you need to stand for. You need to be the testimony to that name. You see, beloved, his name stands for God and deity. His name stands for all things that are holy and righteous and godly and pure. That's what his name stands for. His name stands for, stands for pardon and for forgiveness, beloved. And it stands for hope and for heaven and for eternal life. All things you can't get anywhere else except from God. Would you say amen? So I don't know about you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to name drop Jesus' name when I stand before the bower of God on that day of judgment. How about you? That's what I'm going to do. Oh, Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. I've been trying. <laughs> so, beloved, you better uphold that holy name in your life. And you listen to me. You ought not to call yourself a Christian if you're not going to try to uphold it and honor it in your life. Don't go around saying, I'm a Christian, and going out and drinking and smoking and doing all the things you ought not to do and lying and cheating. Don't do it. Just shut your mouth and go your way. I want you to look at verse number one again. David says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. And you want to talk about name dropping, beloved. Why would God name drop Jacob here? Why in the world would he do it? You see, beloved, could it ever be possible that any human being could add more luster and importance to God's name? Beloved, could it ever be possible that Jacob's name would make God's name more influential or more important than it already is? Could it ever be possible that the name of Jacob would make the Lord's name more credible in the earth or respectable or honorable? Could it ever be possible, beloved? Does not the Bible teach that God has magnified his name above heaven and earth? Not only his word, he says, I have magnified my name above heaven and earth. Would you say amen out there? Indeed he has. Look at verses 5 and 7 again. He says, we will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Verse number 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. This is, you're in the battle, spiritual battle, by the way, for us. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now, the, notice, the psalmist exhorts us here to rejoice in God's salvation and to rejoice in His name. Then in verse 7, beloved, notice your text. He says we're to remember the name of our God. Not Jacob's name, even though it's mentioned right here. So why in the world does God name drop Jacob here, beloved? His name, to me, only conjures up and conveys many bad connotations that I know about the life of Jacob in the Bible. Why bring up the name of a cheat? Beloved, why bring up the name of a fraud or a thief or a deceiver? Why bring up this name? This man was a schemer. He was, beloved, listen to me now, he was a con man before other people, always trying to get what he wanted, always lying, always cheating, always frauding. But the name of the Lord God defend thee, Jacob? So it just seems logical to me that if God was going to name drop an associate with, uh, or associate with someone, his name should be with someone who had at least a good character, don't you think? Or perhaps someone with a good reputation, beloved, that could literally add some merit or some honor to the name of the Lord God of heaven and earth. You see, beloved, but he didn't do that. Instead, he said, Jacob, 
the God of Jacob. Really? Seriously, Lord? Jacob? You know what I think of Jacob anyways. I think he was a marshmallow. Why him, beloved? I want you to bear with me in my folly. I'm going to try to explain this to you. Listen to me now. The Lord could have said this. The God of the great high priest Melchizedek defend thee. But he didn't say that. The Lord could have said uh, that the God of Abraham, your illustrious forefather, and my friend defend thee, but God didn't say that. Beloved, the Lord could have said this. He's the, the God defend thee of Moses, the great lawgiver. I'll defend you. God didn't say that. Beloved, the Lord could have said the God of Samuel, that great judge and prophet of Israel. He didn't say that. Hey, I got an idea. Why did he, he say the name of the God of Jacob defend thee? Oh, excuse me. Joseph. Not Jacob. Joseph. He was the son of Jacob. You see, beloved, Joseph was a man of such great faith and character, we find in the scriptures, that he'd rather lose his job and go to jail than shack up with Potiphar's wife, who was a temptress who was always trying to seduce him. Joseph was a great man of God, beloved, in the days. And he didn't have a Bible like we do. He didn't have a church down the street. He learned from what mama and daddy had taught him. But Joseph didn't do that. Instead, Joseph said this. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? But God did not bring up the name of Joseph. He didn't say that. You see, beloved, if God wanted the name drop, uh, all of these righteous people, then I think he'd have been in pretty good company, don't you? I mean, Moses, good company. Joseph, good company. Uh, Samuel, good company, real good company. But God didn't say that, beloved. He said, instead, the name of uh, the God of Jacob will defend thee. Now, that's name dropping to me. How about you? What is it he wants to teach us, beloved? Why did he say that? Now, listen to me carefully. Because this is the gist of my sermon, and I don't want you to miss this, even though I'm going to try to drive it home. Because King David wants all men to know that God welcomes bad company. But, listen to me now, that is all those who respond to his divine call and overtures in their life, and then they repent and turn to him like Jacob finally and ultimately did. He isn't saying God's running around and hanging out with jeets and drunks and stuff like that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that those hearts that are bent toward me, that want to come to me, like Jacob ultimately did. But I had a deal with Jacob for a while. And sure, Jacob was a trickster, beloved. Sure, he was a tr uh, uh, supplanter and a con man. But after years of God dealing with him, and God dealt with him through hard and bitter lessons in his life, beloved, finally one day he woke up and he smelled the roses and he got right with God. Would you say amen? God was shaking him, and just like he does to us sometimes, he shakes us and shakes us that we'll finally wake up. And he does that after we get saved also. You hear me now? You see, beloved, God will shake you. This text is speaking about Jacob. Now listen to me. After he got converted, not before he got converted. What kind of company would that have been for a righteous God of heaven and earth to keep company with a swindler like that, a schemer? A slippery customer like that. Beloved, he was a bad actor. I mean, you can't even read this text in the Bible and say, this guy was a schemer from the moment he came out of the womb. All of his life. He was a little mama's boy. Mama spoiled him rotten. The, the great influence in his life was not uh, uh, his father, uh, beloved. The great influence was Isaac. The great influence in his life was his mama. Mama did this for him. Mama do that. You want to come with hear me? You want to come with me? Put the skirt on. Put the shirt apron on. Okay. Mama feminized them like we're doing in America today. We're feminizing the masculinity of America today. I hate to say that. You want to shoot me? Good, good. I scratch you right where it itched. You see, beloved, I want you to think about this bad character. Think about it. He conned, he conned his older brother Esau into selling him his birthright, beloved. That is the lion's share of his father's inheritance. And if that weren't enough, then what he did was he conned his daddy Isaac. And Isaac was almost blind at that time, but he talked him into getting the blessing. And you see, beloved, he impersonated Esau. He kind of dressed up with Esau. You know the story. Mama put the sheepskin on him and the goat hair on him because Esau was a hairy man. And then he went to Daddy. Here, Daddy, here's that venison that you want. Oh, let me see. That voice sounds like Jacob, but 
And he rubbed the head. Oh, but you know, the smell is the, of a man of the field. It must be Esau. He took advantage of daddy you couldn't see. Daddy was getting old right now. He needed some glasses, but he didn't have any in those days. And so, beloved, the birthright and the blessing was rightfully Esau's. He was the firstborn son. And what did it mean to have the blessing and the birthright? Now listen to me. This meant that Esau was supposed to inherit the largest share of his father's wealth, but Jacob stole that. See, he was the firstborn son. He gets the lion's share. Why? Because the name has to be carried on through the firstborn son. That was the purpose of what we call Leverite marriage in the Bible, but I don't have time to go there. Look it up. But also, beloved, uh, uh, this meant that Esau was supposed to be the inheritor of the Abrahamic covenant and progenitor of the line through which the Messiah was going to come. And when Esau found out that Jacob had stolen his blessing and his birthright, beloved, he wanted to kill him. And all of a sudden, Mama goes over to Jacob, you better run for your life. You better go to your uncle Laban's house in Mesopotamia because your brother Esau is going to kill you. So what did Jacob do? <laughs> the Bible says he fled to his uncle Laban's home in Pandanaram in Mesopotamia, 200 plus miles away to escape the wrath and the murderous intent of his brother Esau. And Jacob ran so hard, the Bible says, and so fast, beloved, to on his way to his uncle Laban's home that he finally fell down, he couldn't go any farther, and he was exhausted. Boom, he falls down. And as he laid there, you know, he's kind of looking around for a pillow, but all he could find was a rock, the Bible says. So he took this rock, and he put his head on it, and he went to sleep. As he went to sleep, the Bible says a deep sleep fell over him, and he had a shocking and a frightening dream. This is what we know as Jacob's ladder, amen? He saw a ladder going up to heaven, uh, from earth to heaven, beloved, and angels ascending and descending upon it. And in the midst of that dream, he heard a powerful voice speak to him from heaven. And God introduced himself. He says, I am the God of your father Isaac. I am the God of your father Abraham. And I am watching you. I am going to work through you. You see, beloved, God started telling him he was going to give him and his children the promised land of Canaan. But Jacob wasn't married yet. Jacob didn't have any children yet. And yet God, looking ahead, who knows the future, says, this is what I'm going to do. You see, beloved, God told him that I'm going to protect you wherever you go. And Jacob, wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. Now, do you believe that, Jacob? Oh, well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Even in the dream, he couldn't admit and say, okay, Lord. And then, beloved, God told him that he was going to make him a great nation, and through his loins, the Messiah would ultimately come. In other words, God was really dealing with Jacob. Is he dealing with you? Is God dealing with you? I had a dream this morning, early this morning, probably about 2.30, and I thought about it afterwards. I told my wife about it, but I believe what the Lord was doing was there was a person that did me great harm. After I had spent 25 years, I led this person to the Lord. I taught them. I did all kinds of things, beloved. The person lived over my house. I'd come into the house. He'd be helping himself to the refrigerator. I'm serious. He'd just make a long story short. This person did me great harm. But in the dream, I saw myself running down a corridor. And as I was running down the corridor, that person was there. And I says, hey, so-and-so. And I went by and I heard that person say, ooh, wow. And I believe God was testing me to see if my heart was bitter. To see if I was holding a grudge. And I'm not holding a grudge. Though I don't trust the person, I never would again. I never let him come in the door. Why? I don't want him to corrupt the sheep. There's much more than me at stake here, beloved, because I'm your pastor. Amen? But anyways, what I'm saying is this here, is that night God ratified the Abrahamic covenant and the blessing and the birthright to Jacob. Well, beloved, Jacob awoke and he thanked God. But then he made a vow and he said, Lord, if you truly bless me like this, then I'll follow you. Always a condition. Isn't that the way we are? Always make it. If you do this, Lord, then I'll do that. You don't have a right to do that. Neither do I. But then Jacob, as he woke up, he set up a rock, beloved. And this rock was a memorial to recall that incident. And he called that rock Bethel. In other words, he reckoned, he says, is this not anything but the house of God? That's what Bethel means. 
But then he continued his flight into Mesopotamia, beloved. He finally gets to his uncle Laban's house, and he spent 20 years there, and God richly blessed him. He gave him two wives, Leah and Rachel, and he had 12 sons. Remember, they were later called the 12 sons of Israel, or the 12 tribes of Israel. So God greatly blessed him with great wealth and cattle, beloved. You know, the Bible says in Romans 2, 4, that the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance. God blesses you some before you got saved. Did he give you food? Did he give you opportunities? Did he give you jobs? Did he put the right people in your path? God saying the goodness of God is to lead you to repentance. But it didn't do that with Jacob. God still had to deal with him. God still had to shake him up. What is he going to do in your life? Does he still have to shake you up, beloved? You see, but anyways, Jacob gets to his uncle Laban's house, and guess what he finds out, beloved? His uncle Laban is a worse con man than he is. The con man got conned. Not one time, again and again and again. And old Uncle Laban, the Bible says, kept lying to him and cheating him in trade, beloved. And it also says he changed Jacob's wages ten times. Jacob had been out scheming. Jacob had been out cheating everybody. Jacob had been out deceiving. And what did God say? Yeah, as you plant, so you what? Reap. As you sow, you're going to reap. And did he reap it? Absolutely. You hear me now? That's the law of reciprocity, folks. You will not escape. Be sure your sin will find you out. Isn't that what the Bible says? You may forget about it. Five years may go by, and then God shakes you to the core. And he says, you remember that? You remember that? Youth, I gave you five years to repent, and you didn't do it. You infringed on my mercy. You didn't do it. So anyways, Jacob, now he's sees that Laban's countenance has changed toward him. I want you to follow me this progression. So 20 years later, as Jacob's in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, and God had started working out some of this sin in them, and he started showing them, how's it feel to be deceived, Jacob? <laughs> you like it? How do you, how'd you think your brother Esau felt? How do you think your daddy felt? How do you think Uncle Laban felt? You were cheating him, he was cheating you. How does it feel, Jacob? And that what happens in our life sometimes? We get indignant. Somebody deceives us, cheats us, and we do the same thing, you hypocrite. Right? Oh, I don't like being on the other end of that. But no, but you can give it, but you can't take it. Amen? So what am I saying to you? Finally, God sees that he's shaken the, uh, Jacob enough. And so after 20 years, beloved, Jacob sees that his uncle Laban, is, his countenance is not toward him like it was before that Uncle Laban's jealous of him right now. So God again speaks to Jacob. And he says, Jacob, what I want you to do is I want you to go back home to Canaan. So Jacob says, okay. But before he goes, he cheats Uncle Laban a little bit more. He gets a little bit more of his goats and his sheep and his rams, beloved. And one day he sleeks away, the Bible says, with Leah and Rachel and all of his family, all of his kids, all of his herds, all of his livestock, where uh, Laban was three days away from him. He says, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm going back to Canaan. Still a schema. Still a deceiver. Still a con man. Amen? But you see, beloved, he wasn't saved yet. God was dealing with him, but he was not saved yet. He had a head knowledge of God, but he did not yet have a heart knowledge of God. And there's 18 inches difference that can make the difference between whether or not you go to heaven or hell, those 18 inches. You hear me now? So many Christians sit in churches today, think because they know the name of Jesus, they know about Jesus, they're going to heaven. That is not true. You better follow Jesus. You better obey Jesus. You see, beloved, then you have true faith. People think nothing of not coming to church, think nothing of breaking God's laws, nothing of that. And they say, I still want to go to heaven. And they name drop the name of Jesus. That's a fool's hope in your life. And the sooner you understand it, the better off you're going to be. So anyways, beloved, Jacob sets off and he goes home again. Now he knows that his uncle Laban is behind him. He says, oh no, uncle Laban's coming with his armies and they're going to try to get me. They're going to try to harm me. They're going to try to steal all of my family. They're going to take my herds back. Then his servant comes up, so I got some more bad news for you. He says, your brother Esau with 400 armed men are in front of you. 400, yeah, and he's mad because you stole his birthright and his blessing. (laughs) 
and he's coming to get it back. And not only that, he wants to take your family, your courage, all of that. What you stole from him, he's going to steal from you now. So here's Jacob. He's sandwiched in between Laban and his brother. Well, that night, beloved, as Laban closed in, God divinely intervenes. God says to Laban, don't you touch that boy. Don't you say anything good or bad to him, because I'm with him. Laban finally catches up with Jacob, and they argue back and forth. But ultimately, they reconcile, and Laban lives, leaves in peace, and he goes back home. But now he's got another threat. It's Esau, 400 men. Run, ha, rum, rum, rum. They're coming. They're coming. They're going to kill him, right? So Jacob takes his family, he splits them in two groups. Now there was a stream there, or a brook, it was called Jabbok. And so Jacob says, look it, you know, the only thing I can do, I'm going to send my servant on on ahead to meet uh, Esau, and I'll give him some uh, gifts. I'll give him 200 camels. Imagine 200, and Jacob still had money left. He went over with just a staff and his cane. He comes back a rich man. And he says, I'm going to give him some herds, and I'm going to give him some sheep. And so that ought to take the fire out of him because I know he's very vengeful right now. So he splits his family into two groups. He's thinking, you know what, if they kill one group, at least I got another. So they both cross over the brook Jabbok. And then Jacob that night, the Bible says, he fell on his face. And he started praying before God. And God sent an angel. And he says, cross over the brook Jabbok. I will be with thee. Now you want to talk about a step of faith, amen? Because you're going right into the jaws of the lion right now. So Jacob goes across that brook. And he starts uh, 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 going toward Esau, beloved. And as he does, all of a sudden, he gets on his face and he starts praying. And as he's praying, he's attacked by someone. Jacob thinks it's abandoned. And, <clears throat> and he's fighting for his life right now. And can you imagine, beloved, you're in your prayer and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, somebody attacks you and you start wrestling? They didn't have flashlights in them days. Who are you? All right, they didn't have any of that. He's wrestling with someone right now. But now he finds out it's the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ himself. Oh, beloved, let me interject this here. Listen carefully now before I go any further. Many times in the midst of our money, many times in the midst of our wealth, our prosperity, our blessing, beloved, we also forget God just like Jacob did. We do it. I've seen it as a minister all these years. Often things are not conducive. These things just aren't conducive, beloved, to our moral and spiritual growth. When everything's going fine, we don't think anything about it. We don't pray as often as we ought to pray. We don't seek God as often as we ought to seek Him. We don't trust God like we are. So we're trusting ourselves now. I got the good job. I got some money in my pocket. I've got some money in the Shabbat. I got it packed away right now. Okay, I, I, I can take a few hard days here. And, beloved, we don't listen to God like we ought to. We don't serve God like we ought to. And then when God does speak to us and we don't like what he says, we ignore him. God puts people in your path. God puts the pastor to preach something to you. And you don't want to hear it. You see, all you want to hear is what you want to hear. Amen? Not what you need to hear. And so we ignore God like Jacob did. So you know what God does? He sends us enemies too. You know what God does? He also sends us problems in our life, beloved, to take us down a peg or two like he had to do with Jacob. Now, beloved, that night, Jacob's praying. I want you to see him. He's praying. He's crying. He's scrapping. He's fighting for his very life, beloved, with this divine visitor and refusing to let him go. He says, I won't let you go till you bless me. And the divine visitor said, let me go. He says, I won't let you go till you bless me. He says, I said, let me go. He says, I won't let you go until you bless me. Now, praise the Lord, Jacob was insistent and persistent. Amen? Hear me now. Listen to me, beloved. By nature, you and I both are as crooked and deceptive as Jacob was. So therefore, we need to struggle and wrestle with God just like he did until he answers our persistent prayers in our life. You see, beloved, we must struggle to be saved and sanctified. It's a battle. The Bible says we must labor to enter in, strive uh, that we may enter in. You see, beloved, we must struggle to be faithful and obedient to God. You must struggle to be an overcomer and inherit all of the blessings God wants to give you. Amen? He that endureth to the end, the same, Jesus said, shall be saved. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13 and 14. 
Finally, beloved, as dawn broke, God touched the inside of Jacob's thigh and he crippled him so he wouldn't let him go. I mean, so he'd let him go. And I thought about that. I said, you know, when he touched Jacob, he, he touched him right about here, right with the hip. The bone comes into the hip. That's called the shank. And even to this day, Jews, pious Jews, won't eat the shank of an animal because of that night. They do it out of tradition. But you know, sometimes God has to cripple us like that. Why? So we'll listen to him. Sometimes God has to cripple us, beloved, so we'll let go of that besetting sin that we've been, been convicting of us year after year, sermon after sermon, devotion after devotion, but we won't let it go. And God said, I'm going to cripple you. You see, beloved, sometimes, just like Jacob, we find out that our real struggle, we're really wrestling with God. That's who we're struggling with. He's the one that's bringing the problems in our life. He's the one that's doing this. Why? Look up! Look up! Thy God seeth thee! That's what he's saying. I want you to look up. Your God's dealing with you. He's been trying to deal with you. You think he's going to send you a text? No, he's not going to do that, beloved. Anyways, God then blessed him. And he supernaturally changed his nature and his name from Jacob to Israel. Now, beloved, I have to get a kick out of this. God says to him, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. In other words, God knew who his name was. Are you saying to me, Jacob, that your name really means you're the deceiver? You're the fraud? You're the con man? You're the cheat? Is that what you're saying to me? That's what your name stands for? Yes, Lord, that's what I'm saying. No, not anymore. This night, you have prevailed with me. Now you're one who prevails with God. Now you're one who is changed by God. Now you are one who is ruled by God. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, praise the Lord. Now the supplanter became a saint of God. Now the deceiver became a disciple of God. Now the con man became a new man of God. Would you say amen? Oh, I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So God welcomes bad company, beloved. In other words, he hangs out with bad people like Jacob, whose heart is disposed to seek him and serve him after they realize God is really dealing with them. You know, I was thinking about that. I'm saying Jesus, the Bible says, hangs out with bad people. But they're people with a penitent heart, beloved. You see, they're people with a contrite spirit who are seeking and striving to get right with God. You know, the Bible says that, Jesus said this, listen to me. He says, everyone that comes, all those that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's a friend of sinners, wasn't he? He not only was, he is. Beloved, Jesus said this. He said, he came to call sinners to repentance and not the righteous. See, he's always seeking to save that which is lost, isn't he? But you know, he doesn't force us against our will, does he? And we often, beloved, we abuse that grace and that mercy in our life, don't we? You see, beloved, not only that, he says, I've come to save people from the uttermost to the guttermost. No matter what you did in your life, I'll save you if you come to me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls for my, what? Yoke is easy and my burden is light, but it's still a yoke, and that's no yoke and a burden. So you've got to pick up your cross daily, and you've got to follow the Lord. Amen. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that's what Jacob ultimately did. He started following the Lord, do you? You see, God hung out with Noah, who got drunk, beloved. But then when Noah recovered himself, he worshipped the Lord. You see, God hung out with King David, who was a murderer and an adulterer. But, but because he was a man after God's own heart, he ultimately, when his sin was pointed out, he fell on his face before God, and he begged for the mercy of God, and he got it. Would you say amen? God hung out with Moses. Moses was a killer. He, killed, he was going to kill someone else too, beloved. Forty years. He can divide his life into three 40 years. He could live to 120. 40 years he was in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, and then 40 years he was trying to lead the people, children of Israel through the wilderness. I don't know how he did it. I, I honestly don't know that. But you see, God hung out with him, didn't he? God hung out with Samson. Samson was a gigolo. 
<laughs> okay. Samson was culpable of it. But the Bible says he repented after he had his eyes plucked out, after he got his hair cut in the devil's barber shop by that hussy Delilah. And the Bible says that he killed more people in his death than he did in his life because he was trying to deliver Israel from their oppressors. God hung out with Jehu. If you ever read about Jehu, he was a wild man. He was crazy, crazy for the Lord. He wiped out the house of King Ahab and Jezebel. And then, beloved, how about God hanging out with Paul? Oh, Paul, I think about it all the time. Paul was a persecutor of the church, an executor of the church, beloved, but then he becomes the great evangelist and preacher in the church. Amen. And then we see here God hangs out with Jacob. You see, what I'm saying to you is God welcomes bad people who wrestle with him and repent and constantly and continuously seek after him like all these other men did. When they realized God was dealing with them, they said, this is it. This is nothing but the hand of God in my life, and I'm going to follow him. And I may add, before things get even worse, Oh, beloved, God welcomes the bad company of ex-prostitutes. Rahab, the harlot. Mary Magdalene, in whom seven demons passed out. And God welcomes the bad company of drunks, ex-drunks, and ex-drug addicts, and ex-criminals, beloved, and con men, and liars, and all sinners who will cry out to him here like Jacob did. And then what does he do? He supernaturally changes their nature, and then he changes their name, beloved, and he's given a brand new name because they're brand new creatures in Christ. They are Christians. They are little Christ. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, no longer are these sinners. Now they're saints. And no longer are they deceivers, now they're disciples. And no longer are they the enemies of God, now they're the elect of God. No more are they the children of the devil, but blessed be God, now they're in the kingdom of light, they're children of God, in the kingdom of God, beloved. Would you say amen out there? Children of God, beloved, and they are going to live in eternity with God himself because God has changed their nature and God has changed his name. God welcomes and hangs out with bad people who want to hang out with him. You want to hang out with God? Well, you know what you got to do, beloved. You listen to me. Now, don't you miss this, and I'll close. I'm two minutes over. I'm trying to work this out here. Beloved, if you want God to welcome you, you've got to seek God. Just like Jacob had to do. Just like these men had to do. If you want God to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, then you have to repent of your sin. You have to walk in a state of repentance. And you have to pursue God. As we walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, what does it do? It keeps on cleansing us from sin. As we walk in the light of truth. And then you've got to be a man after God's own heart. Just like David, who wrote about Jacob here. Amen? Look at verse 1 again. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Indeed, he's saying God welcomes bad company like you and me. I put you before me here. I had it the other way around in my notes, but I know what. They're worse than me. God welcomes us. Amen. All those that come to me, I'll no wise cast out. The question is this. Will you welcome God? Will you? Not your way. The way he wants to be welcomed. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and he opens that door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and I will be his God and they shall be my people. God welcomes bad company. Let's go to the phone.